So Joe, for Christians who are called into public office, what lessons can they take away from the life and work of William Wilberforce? Well, I think the life of William Wilberforce is obviously very, very instructive for anybody going into public life um, or political life as a Christian. One of the disappointing and discouraging things that we see so often at the moment when a Christian goes into public life, having confessed or professed um, a firm faith, is that all of a sudden uh, those convictions begin to be watered down or they dissipate or they practically vanish altogether so that you wouldn't even know uh, that the person was a Christian at all. At least their faith seems to have no bearing little or no bearing on their um, views on public policy, on public issues. And of course, that's very discouraging, it's very disheartening, and um, we see it all of the time, unfortunately, it's a sad, it's a sad fact. Uh, Wilberforce, on the other hand, um, was a man of deep and pr profound um, Christian conviction. Now, of course, we recognize that the way in which uh, political life parliament worked in those days was somewhat different to the way op uh, to the way opposites now it was easier to be an independent like Wilberforce and have an independent voice and so forth rather than uh, dealing with the issue of the party whips and so on but nonetheless uh, his uh, character and his focus are very instructive first of all Wilberforce did understand that you can't change a culture you can't change people in the end you can't bring about lasting change unless the beliefs and practices of the people, the worldview, if you like, of the people is altered. So it's not just enough to enact social policy. There has to be a change in the thinking and the living of, of, of the people. So at one point, Wilberforce was involved in um, a, a, a political instrument for the suppression of um, public vice, which he got the support of the king for. Uh, and so he recognized that as you... Uh, uh, encourage, for example, in that in that era, sheriffs or magistrates to uphold the law as they should be, and you begin to shape people's lives ethically, you can impact their thinking and you will impact their living. It's not just a matter of um, politicians making policy and imposing it from on high. So he understood that both beliefs and uh, social practices will greatly shape political life. And uh, he, in a, in a sense, he understood that politics was downstream of culture. Uh, political life is being shaped by the culture um, more than the other way around. It's not the political life, polit politicians are changing the culture, but rather uh, politics is downstream of culture. So that, that's critically important. I think the second thing anybody who's going into public life can learn is courage. I mean, people threatened the life of Wilberforce when he was in pursuit of the abolition of the slave trade and of some of his other uh, um, justice pursuits, uh, but particularly the abolition movement because there was so much vested interest, because there were so many powerful people who were supportive of the slave trade, because so much money was involved, he was threatened, um, they, they were intimidated, they were scorned, they were laughed at, they were mocked, and so on. And uh, you need courage to face that. And let's face it, courage is in short supply today. We have all of these issues that are actually uh, facing us with respect, for example, to uh, the life of not just the unborn now, but the elderly, the sick, uh, the depressed, the dying. Uh, we have the radical um, agenda of agenda mainstreaming, which is trying to irre uh, irrevo irrevocably sort of alter our understanding of family and human sexuality uh, and to stand up to these very powerful movements, powerful lobbies, powerful elites, powerful people in the media, that takes courage. It means being willing to be attacked, to be laughed at, to be shot at, to be considered something of a social pariah today if you even dare to uphold a Christian understanding of marriage and the family and of life and of so on and so on and so forth. That have been the, the bedrock of Western civilization, courage. So uh, the Christian worldview, courage. And then uh, there is, of course, determination. It's not just en enough to be courageous for a day, for a week, for one campaign, for uh, a short season. Wilberforce committed his, the entirety of his life with an undying determination to see the evil of slavery uh, destroyed, to see it overturned. And it's going to take a similar kind of commitment from Christians in public life 
to see the present evils that are all around us. Uh, uh, we've got the sex slave, uh, sex trade industry, um, the, uh, the pornography industry, prostitution, the one driving the other. Uh, it's all a criminal um, movement, the whole thing. Uh, uh, and they feed one another. Uh, we've mentioned the abortion industry. Um, we've got the, the, the radical um, gender mainstreaming. Uh, that's an industry as well now. Uh, we've got all of these movements with power and money behind them. And it's going to take not just courage, it's going to take determination and faithfulness in the fight, uh, in the conflict, in terms of Christ and his word to see this battle um, to an end. Um, and th those are the things I think we take um, from the public life of William Wilberforce. There's one thing I would add. It's impossible to uh, see those things, uh, those conflicts, those battles through to the end without a vital uh, a communion with Christ. And uh, that is what Wilberforce had. And, and you see that in his book, you see it um, in his letters, uh, that uh, there, is a, there is a vibrant, vital Christianity that is actuating everything that Wilberforce is about. It, it, it comes out of every pore, you know, in his marriage, with his children, with his acquaintances, in it, as well as his political life. It, it's, it's, it defines the man. And uh, with that uh, uh, deep um, Christian faith, that, that deep conviction, that, that, that profound commitment to Christ and his word, uh, there was a man of prayer. And uh, something that he said at the very end of his life, I think, is so instructive. Uh, he, he said this um, as he reflected um, on his life at the end. He says, I must confess that my own solid hopes for the well-being of my country depend not so much on her navies and armies, nor on the wisdom of her rulers, nor on the spirit of her people, but on the persuasion that she still contains many who love and obey the gospel of Christ, I believe that their prayers may yet prevail. So he believed in prevailing prayer. And I think we have um, radically separated these things. We've kind of said that the Christian life, prayer and scripture, those things are important in the church. And then you have your secular life and secular world out there. Um, and we've separated, we've run an, an unbiblical dichotomy, a bifurcation through reality uh, that said there's uh, one truth for my spiritual life and one truth for my uh, secular vocational or working life. Wilberforce, like scripture, recognized no such division. Christ, his lordship and his word applies to the totality of our lives and bathed in the power of prayer with courage and determination and faithfulness. Wilberforce is living proof that a man can change his times even if he can't do it alone. And so the collaboration that he was involved with, which would be a, a final key, I guess, for those entering public life is work with other Christians, partnerships with other believers, pe people in the church, people in politics, people in medicine, people in law, people in diplomacy, people in the sciences, that they work and partner together in terms of a common vision of Christ's lordship to bring about change. And that was the key to Wilberforce's success. Mm -hmm.